we just start anytime Zach's ready. I mean, it could be five after, it could be ten after. Just appreciate it, Zach, anytime. There's a guy who decided that the, the, the world was going crazy, and he felt like he needed to become a monk. And he checked out all the monasteries, and there was one that you took a vow of silence, and you could say two words every ten years. And so he thought, you know what? I just feel like I've talked too much in my life anyway. I think this is going to be exactly where I need to go. And so, checks into this monastery, delivers all his earthly goods to them. They say, all right, from this point on, you get to say two words every ten years. Ten years goes by. He comes before the heads of the monastery, and he gets to say his two words. He says, food, bad. They say, okay, well, go back to your regular duties. Ten more years, you can come and say anything else you want. So ten more years go by. It's been 20 years, two decades. And he comes before the head of the monastery, and it's time for him to say his two words. And he says, bed hard. They say, well, you know, I don't know about this guy, but okay, fine. So he goes back. Another ten years goes by. It's been 30 years. He comes back and says, I quit. Head of the monastery said, that's, that's fine. You ain't done nothing but complain since you got here. <laughs> now, we're in Philippians 2, and we're looking at the mind of Christ. And you look down there in about verse 5, and it tells you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, you stop right there and you ask yourself, so the Bible is about to tell us how to have the mind of Christ, that we can think like Jesus thought. And, like Jesus still thinks, and he's going to tell you some things that Jesus did that if we were to mimic, that would be the mind of Christ. And one of the things that I'd like to just skip a few verses and get over to is there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. And then you look at verse 14. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring. And disputing, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Let me ask you this question. If I were right now to ask the congregation, I want you to objectively answer this question on a piece of paper. Please don't answer it out loud. I want you to write down the ten people in this congregation that are the most complainy, grumbly, gripey people. You think this congregation could do it? You could, okay, and you would, because griping and complaining is very common, it's very easy to see, and it's wrong. Let me ask you this question. Under what circumstance would you ever see Jesus gripe or complain? Man, it's too hot out here. Can you believe the elders decided to go over 15 minutes? Can you believe that... Under what circumstance can you see Jesus complain? Now, the mind of Christ says that Jesus leaves heaven. It's not something that he felt like he had to hold on to. It's something that he felt like he would give up in order to come down to earth and put himself in a situation that would be in every single way, listen to me, in every single way more uncomfortable than he had it before. You think Jesus ever griped about mosquitoes? He signed up for it. He knew what he was doing, and he came to this planet and never once complained. Now, what I'd like to suggest to us that we know but lots of times we don't want to admit, is complaining is a sin. There's no circumstance under which it would be right to complain. And yet we do it on a regular basis. And when I say we, I'm not using editorial we. I'm not saying we, meaning y'all, but not me. I'm saying we all complain. And what do we have the right to complain about. Well, we're going to look at some ideas about complaining in the Bible and just see what God thinks and says about it. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
we're going to listen to Paul tell us about the history of the Jewish nation. And you're going to look at verse 5. And there in verse 5, Moreover, brethren, verse 1, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers passed under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the spiritual drink. Verse 5, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Okay, now let that sink in. Most of them didn't make God happy and he killed them in the wilderness. They died. Okay, so what was it that was so bad that these Israelites did that God killed them in the wilderness? Well, he goes in and he starts telling you some of the terrible, awful, horrible things that the Israelites were guilty of. Notice what he says right there. Now, these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Don't become idolaters as some of them. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality. Look at how terrible they were. They worshipped idols. You know, in our minds we think, okay, well, those idol worshipers, they deserve to get it. They were sexually immoral. Deserve it. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted Christ and were destroyed by serpents. Tempted Christ. Deserve it. Nor murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Some of them were idolaters, God killed them. Some of them were sexually immoral, God killed them. Some of them were complainers. What did God do? Killed them. Why is it that complaining is so detestable to God? Because here's what you're saying. When you complain, here's what you're saying. God you are not doing your job right. You're telling God that your life should be different and you feel like you've got a right, you feel like you deserve, you feel like somehow God should be changing it for your situation to be different. Basically, you're telling God, God, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And guess what? God's always doing what He's supposed to be doing. Now, let's look at the place that this passage is most likely talking about. You know, there are several places in the Old Testament where the Israelites complained and murmured and griped and did things that we would put in the complaining, murmuring, griping category. But if you turn back to the book of Numbers and you look at Numbers 11, here in Numbers 11, my heading on my New King James 1987 Thomas Nelson translation, the heading of the chapter says, the people complained. Now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and His anger was aroused, so the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Okay, some people complain, God sends fire and burns them up that are outside the main part of the camp. Now, let's step back just a, a second. Does God burn up everybody who complains? No. You know, thankfully, uh, wouldn't be here today if I was still under some of these. Okay, God didn't even kill all the Old Testament people who ever complained. Now, 1 Corinthians tells you why God killed some of them. God didn't even kill all the sexual immoral. He didn't kill all the idolaters. Why did God kill some of the people who complained in the Old Testament? Here's why. He says, He wants you to know how serious it is. Now, I'm not going to kill everybody that ever complains, but I want you to know I'm going to, these people are going to die and they're going to be your example because I'm not killing all complainers, but I'm going to kill these complainers so you know how serious I take murmuring and complaining. That's the point. Okay, now, watch what he says. So he called the name of the place Taborah because the fire of the Lord burned there. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So, so the children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? Now, um, I want you to stop right here and think. Here's where I envision these Israelites making this comment. They're, I see them sitting outside of their tents. Maybe a bunch of the families have gotten together and they're around a campfire and they're reminiscing about the good old days. Now, here's why complaining 
another reason why complaining has no place in a Christian's mind, heart, or mouth. Because complaining means you only remember the stuff that you don't have now and you forget all the bad stuff that was involved at that time. Okay, so the Israelites are sitting around thinking about the good old days, and in their mind, the good old days were when? Oh, when they're in Egypt. Notice what he says. Ah, we remember the fish which we freely ate in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons. I love this one. The leeks. You know what a leek is? It's an onion. Ah, oh, those good old onions. The onions and the garlic. Now, I envision them having a piece of, watch this, here's what they say. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Now, I envision that they have cooked this particular kind of manna as like what I call like a cornbread pancake look to me, like a flapjack looking. And I, think, I see them holding it in my mind. And they're sitting there kind of eating on it. And when they get to the sense, we don't have anything but this. And maybe it's kind of soggy and floppy. And they're looking at it and saying, we, we ain't got nothing but this manna. Now, the text then pauses. You ever heard somebody telling a story and they're really shading the story their way so that they look better than they really should be looking? You know, it's like, and nothing but this manna. Well, it'd be one thing if the manna tasted like sandpaper and, you know, uh, gravel. It'd be one thing. We don't have anything but this manna. Yeah, well, the manna's like, oh, but the, the biblical text, God gives you a commentary on this manna. Notice what he says. Now, manna was like coriander seed, and its color was like the color of bedellium. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on a millstone, beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans, and made cakes on it. And its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And then another place in Exodus says, pastry that is prepared with honey. Okay, now think about this. You've got two million people wandering around in the wilderness. They cry out to God, hey, we want some food. God says, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Every morning you get up, you're going to get to walk outside, pick it up off the ground. And guess what? It's going to taste like pastry made with oil and honey. How much honey would you have to sweeten uh, food for two million people every day? How many beehives would you have to have to give somebody, okay, now a pastry made with oil. This is, this is literally, not even really trying to joke here. This is a heavenly honey bun. It's what you've got. It's like a pastry made with oil and honey. Now, you don't find honey in the wilderness. You have very little oil. There are no uh, olive Trees that you can press olive oil out of. You don't have much of any kind of vegetable oil. Now, maybe you remember that when they were talking about the promised land, God said, you're going to go into the promised land and it's going to be watered from heaven. It's going to be rain come out of the sky. You're not going to have to water your crops like you did gardens in Egypt where you had to carry all the water. He says, I'm going to water the stuff from, from heaven. You ever had a garden? Now, here's the thing about a garden. You don't get to eat of it right when you plant it. And there's a lot of work you have to do to get it to a point where it's producing anything for you. You have to till it. You have to weed it. You have to make sure lots of times that, that there are no bugs that are getting on your tomato plants, those big green you know, caterpillars that can eat 47 times their own weight in 12 seconds. And if you let them go on your plant for one minute, it's gone. None of that. Hey, did you know what the children of Israel had to do to have heavenly donuts. Here's what they do. Walk outside, no tilling, no work, no sweat involved, bend down and pick up their food. And they are wishing they had an onion instead of men. Now, where's my buddy? Oh, right here. All right, this man right here. No, I, thank you. What's your name? Sebastian. Okay, Sebastian. Me and Sebastian had a little exchange in the kitchen yesterday. There was a cheesecake that was sitting right there at the, at the front of the table. 
And Sebastian comes in there, his eyes real big, looks like he's about to get into some food. I said, Sebastian, you getting into this cheesecake? He's like, no. There's a plate of raw green onions right behind the cheesecake. He passes up the cheesecake, grabs the onion like it's Christmas, goes out chomping on it with the biggest green you've ever seen on the ground. I said, Sebastian, I said, you're eating the onion over cheesecake. He said, yeah, man, I love it. Okay. I mean, may, maybe you'd rather have an onion. Maybe. Not me. Not, I'm not a, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going onion over cheesecake. Not going leek over manna. Not. Okay, so for 40 years, God gives the children of Israel a food that tastes like pastry with oil and honey. They don't have to work for it. And they're wishing for onion. And you think, I cannot believe these people. That is about ridiculous. These people are so ungrateful. God is sustaining them with, the Bible says in another place, angels food. And I think that's a statement that just means this stuff is amazing. And they are so ungrateful, aren't they? Oh, pitiful people. It makes sense. Until you think they ate manna for 40 years. Now, I love a honey bun. Love one. Let's say I have a honey bun today for breakfast. And I save some of it and have it for lunch. And I got a whole box of them, the, the nine pack. So I have those for dinner, and it's good for me. I, I, honey buns, they're great for me. I eat them one day, all day long. And I'm thinking, this is, this is amazing, this is great. And the next day, I eat honey buns every day, all day long. For a week. I ate, now, they're good for me. I'm not gaining weight. I'm feeling good. I feel real healthy. But I have a honey bun every day. Well, by about that third week, I'm thinking, what, what can you do to a honey bun? To make it taste just a little bit. I'm, okay, I'm going to fry it. All right, hey, oh, we fry it, and we think, oh, this is awesome. I don't know. I mean, we fry, I was up in Missouri, and these boys had, uh, had fish fries all the time. And they said, man, i got to introduce you to the greatest fried food you've ever seen. Took a, they said, now, you got to buy the Walmart great value kind took a cinnamon roll out of a little can, fried a cinnamon roll. Cinnamon rolls are good. A fried cinnamon roll off the chain. I'm going to fry, fry this honey bun. So for a week you fry it. Oh, it's awesome. Okay, now you've been through. All right, let's say you fry it for a month. Okay, great. I've just eaten honey buns once plain for a month. Now I fried them for a month. Hey, only 39 more years and 10 months left. You start to see what's going on here? Would any of us start to think, oh, I sure like a little variety here. I mean, yeah, God's taking care of me, but not really like I want him to. I mean, I'd like to add something to the menu. We look at him and think, I can't believe these people would complain. And yet, we'll live in a house that's got air conditioning, and we'll walk out and it'll be 95 degrees. And say, oh, so hot out here. Do you know why many people start conversations with a complaint? This is psychologically proven fact. More people will respond to you if you start with a complaint than if you start with something other than a complaint. If you walk out of the service and say, whew, that preacher went too long. Yeah, he did. They will jump right on a complaint. If you walk out and say, wow, that was a great lesson, 40% of the time less, they will respond to you. Why is that? Because... Complaining throughout the world is a recognized and, listen to me, welcomed way to communicate. Now, here is why the Bible says, do not murmur and complain. In verse 14, it says, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Now, look at 15. That you may be blameless and harmless Children of God without fault, this is Philippians 2, children of God without fault in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do you know that you cannot hide a personality that refuses to complain? You can't hide it. Everybody recognizes it because everybody around you who does not have the mind of Christ is, generally speaking, some type of habitual complainer. 
And when you're not, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, let's think about how that would play out in a Christian's life. Let me ask you this question. Have you been in a situation ever in your whole life where you had a right to complain? Paul's writing this, you remember. Uh, Paul's writing it from prison. There, verse 12, chapter 1, Hey, the things which have happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ, and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident in my chains and are much more bold to speak the word of truth. Okay, I'm in prison. But then at the end of chapter 1, he says, Now, this should be nothing new to you. Because do you remember, and, and I'm adding a little stuff to what he's trying to, he said, though, do you remember when I came to Philippi? When I came to Philippi, all right, let's see if we can think about Paul coming to Philippi. Acts chapter 16 comes to Philippi. He is preaching the gospel and that servant girl is following him around saying, this is the preacher of the Lord Most High. And falls him around and yells that all over the place. You think, okay, I mean, why, why interrupt that? That sounds like a great idea. Can you imagine if I was standing up here preaching and we had somebody in the audience that said, he's preaching the truth. You know, the first time I'm like, mm, fine, appreciate that, thank you. About three minutes later, he's preaching the truth. And they just yell it all the time. You know, by about time 10, when everybody's starting to look at the person standing up yelling and they are getting distracted from the message, you would want to say, okay, you know, while, while I appreciate the encouragement, oh, we're going to have to stop all that yelling. Okay, so Paul cast the demon out of this servant girl, and you'll remember what they do. They take him and throw him in the middle of the local jail after they whip him with whips, no telling how many times. These people aren't Jews. They're in Philippi, which is a Roman colony. They don't know Paul is a Roman, and so they treat him like he is not a Roman, which would mean they don't have to count a number of times that they beat him. And they put him and Silas in the stocks. Now, let's think about this. When's the last time you had something applied to you that was intended for the express purpose of hurting you very badly? Uh, I, you know, a whip across your back. What if somebody came and hit you with a whip across your back one time? Would you tell everybody else a story about that? Dude, I was just up there preaching. Somebody didn't like what I had to say. Came up with a big whip. Whipped me right. You see this mark right here? Got the top of my neck right there. Whipped me. What if they do it 50 times? So that my back literally looks like ground beef when they get done with it. Okay. Now, do you remember how Paul got to Philippi? Remember that story? Okay, he wanted to go in Bithynia. Holy Spirit said, nope, can't go in Bithynia. He wanted to go to another place. Holy Spirit said, no, can't go there. He has a dream, and there's a guy from Macedonia that is calling him. Philippi is the chief city of Macedonia. Paul says, okay, God told me to go to Macedonia. So he pulls into Philippi, which is in Macedonia, exactly like God says. The next thing he knows, he's in prison, having been beaten and in the stocks. You know what the stocks are. I mean, I've never been in a stock. Don't wish to ever be in one. The ones that I remember are from the Disney old school Robin Hood cartoon. Remember that one where Friar Tuck is? But now he's only in what we would call maybe half of a stock. He's in where you stand up and you put your head in and your arms in, but you get to stand up. The stocks that Paul and Silas are in, as I understand, are ones where they stretch your feet out as far as they can, and then pull your head and torso over that, and you know what the purpose of the stocks are. After they've beaten you so that your back cannot take any type of pressure without feeling intense pain, if you were to ask, hey, on a scale of 1 to 10, what pain are you feeling now that you've been beaten 50 times with a whip? Yeah, I mean, it's 67 at least. Then they stretch you out so that there's no possible way you can be comfortable. That's the intended purpose. You can't be Comfortable. Can you imagine, Paul, um, coming into some of our congregations on a Sunday morning and listening to people gripe about the temperature in the auditorium? I mean, I know you guys don't do that. I know no one here does that. 
That's a very unusual practice that only happens in 98% of the congregations in the Lord's Church across the country. Uh, thermostat. Now, the congregation where I used to go, there's thermostat right up front. So right up front. And there was the guy who was in charge of the thermostat. Now, if you want to be everyone's hero or public enemy number one, just volunteer to be the deacon in charge of the air conditioning on a Sunday morning. That's all you got to do. Volunteer to be deacon in charge. Uh, he would have people come up to him. And depending on where you sit, here's the problem. See, if you sit under the vent, well, it might be really, really cold. You sit, you sit back up where there's not a vent blowing on you, where it's warm. And so he'd have people come up. He's like, it's the middle of the summer. You would think that the elders wouldn't need this place to be a meat locker. I mean, 65 degrees is freezing. We don't have to have it this cold in here. He's like, well, okay, we'll see, we'll see what we can do about it. Well, the next person comes right behind that particular lady, and this guy says, Man, I've been burning up in here. You think with the money we give on a Sunday morning, we could get some air conditioner in here? Think we can drop it down a little? He said, well, we'll see what we can do. Now, this guy, real deal, said this is how he did it. He said he would wait till the announcements were being given there at the start of the, of the service, in the announcements, though, before any of the worship started or whatever, and he'd kind of make a point of everybody watching him go up to the thermostat, and he'd adjust it. And he'd go back, and afterward, that person that said it was cold, he's like, ah, oh, I sure appreciate you adjusting that thermostat. It was much better today. person that thought it was warm said, man, appreciate you dropping that temperature down for us. It was awesome. Said he didn't even touch it. He just acted like he did something to it. Just the thought of him fixing it helped something. Can you imagine Paul coming into a service where we are sitting on cushioned chairs in an auditorium that you can call the temperature? I want it to be 72. No bugs are involved in coming into this auditorium whatsoever. If it rains, you don't get wet, except for the few little seconds that you might have to walk in that you don't get to come over under the little canopy outside. We've got everything perfect for us. And, and we say, so that we can worship God without distraction. And then we, we gripe about the temperature. Or if we go over five minutes. Or if there's not enough illustrations in our sermon. Or if the you know, song leader doesn't get the pitch right. Hey, I'm with you. It's real, isn't it? So Paul is in the middle of the prison. He's in the stocks intentionally so he can't feel comfortable ever. I mean, some of us will drive to Disney World. It'll be six hours. And we'll get out. And we'll act like we've been in a torture chamber. Man, I can't believe I drove six hours to get down here. It's going to be long line. I bet I ain't even going to get a dog whip. <laughs> we'll get out of there and our back will be hurting. We'll be driving a, a vehicle that's got lumbar support and leather seats and you can cool your seat with a button. And we'll be griping about the drive we chose to take to go to Disney World. Some people do. I mean, nobody in this kind of case. But I'm just saying some people would do that. Paul's in the middle of a prison. His back is beaten to shreds. He's in stocks. Of all the people that have a right to complain about something, who is it? You could say Paul. But... Jesus wouldn't complain about coming to this earth and being crucified on a cross and letting people do unspeakable things to him, beat him so badly that you can't even recognize his face anymore. His appearance was marred worse than any human being, never uttered a single hint, a single syllable of complaint. And what Paul say, you follow me like I follow Christ? Now, let me ask you this question. You got the jailer, he comes up, uh, how many people you think the jailer had ever had in his jail? Hundreds? Thousands? I think the text says he's the head jailer, basically. It indicates that, that he is the guy who has been elevated to the jail manager. Like, he's been around probably the longest. He's probably seen the most people. How many people do you think the Philippian jailer has ever seen in his whole life in Paul and Silas's position, sing praises to the God that allowed them to be in that position. 
Well, you know, I've, I was talking to somebody that was doing something, and, you know, I, I said, of all the people in the whole world that I think have ever done this, ever, I think this man is, is the only one I've ever heard, and I don't think anybody else would do that. One, one, one person that I've ever heard would do this thing. How many do you think the Philippian jailer had ever heard praise God while they were in prison? You know, I'm just going to go out on a limb and start with zero. I'm going to say none. Do you think that Paul and Silas's attitude and actions toward their situation was different from everything that the Philippian jailer had ever seen in his whole life? Yes. And so when that earthquake hits and he rushes in there and every other person he's ever known would be waiting for him if they could with the change to attack him when he ran in or would have already left or would be somewhere else or doing something to get out of their situation. When he comes in there and Paul and Silas have such control over the entire prison with the attitude that they had that when he rushes in to see if everybody's run away and he's about to kill himself, he's about to literally fall on his sword, Paul says to him, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Here. What do you think the Philippian jailer wants to know? What is it about a person that they've got the opportunity to run away, they don't, they've been beaten in their stocks and they praise God and they're nice to me. How many times do you think the Philippian jailer had heard somebody come in there? Well, I don't deserve to be in here. And if I get out and I get a chance to come back and talk to you, I'll be talking to you. But it won't just be a talk. How many times do you think the people that had come into his prison had badmouthed him, had badmouthed him, and cursed him, and vowed revenge against him, and said they were in there unjustly? And you don't hear one syllable about that from Paul and Silas. They're praising God. And when the Philippian jailer comes in, they say, let us tell you about Jesus. You think that the heart of the Philippian jailer was open to Paul and Silas because of their attitude of uncomplaint? If they had complained like everybody else, if they had said they didn't deserve that and do you think the light of Jesus Christ would have shone in that prison like it did the way that they did things? No, it wouldn't have. You know, of all the people in all the world that had the right to complain, there's really only one person that's ever had the right to complain. One. Who's the one person that's ever stepped a foot on this planet that had the right to complain? Jesus Christ. Only person. And yet, you could not in your mind imagine a situation in which Jesus would complain. You know, you look at that as you translate it into secular studies. And there's a guy who wrote a book titled The No Complaining Rule. And in this book, he recounts how he studied this one particular company and wondered why it had taken off so far, why it had so immediately become a very successful company. So he goes, talks to the CEO, and he says, look, man, your company is killing it. Why in the world are you guys doing so well? The guy says, well, we got one rule. He said, the rule is you cannot complain in my company. He said, that doesn't mean you can't think that there's anything wrong with it. It doesn't mean you have to think everything's perfect. He says, you cannot make statements that are designed to bring morale down and throw negativity into the atmosphere without giving something positive that you think would solve the problem. He said, if you have a problem, it's no problem. You go to the higher up that is in charge of your area and you tell them how you think it can be fixed. He said, don't say, man, this company doesn't know how to run a water fountain. He said, you go to the guy in charge of the water fountain and say, we're having to wait in line, and if you would have two water fountains, I think it'd be better. He said, but any useless negativity that is not directed to positive change, you don't say it. He said, if we catch you complaining in this company, we're going to give you one warning. Hey, that's a complaint. We don't do that here. They calculated the amount of billions of dollars that complaining cost companies across the nation, and it's staggering. 
And he said, okay, if we catch you complaining twice, we fire you. You're gone. Uh, you just need to know that up front. This is nothing personal. We have a no complaining rule. If you complain twice, you're out. What if the elders of this congregation had that policy? Hey, you see something you feel like needs adjusting? No problem. This is, we're, we're open to discussion. We're not trying to suppress anybody's opinion. We're not trying to make it where we think everything's perfect. We don't. But if you have something that you feel like is not going the way that it's the best that it could go, you come straight to us and tell us how you think it could be different. We will gladly look into that. And we'll, but do not sit in a pew or walk outside or talk to your neighbor's lady and say, those elders don't know what they're doing. They do. Don't throw useless negativity in the air. Because it doesn't help anybody. Doesn't help you. Doesn't help the congregation. Doesn't help the world to see Jesus. Don't say it. What if you got kicked out of the congregation of the Lord's church if you complained twice? Ooh. Be rough, right there, wouldn't it? I mean, we were, now we're going to be having 12 people here today. It's a, a bigger group than we've had. Like, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm with you there. You know, anytime I preach this, after I get done, I think, Oh, you, you complain, you need, to, you need to change the way you say things. And I do. And after I preached about 38 times, I start making a tiny bit of progress. What if you had a situation where you got fired from a very good paying job if you complained twice? Well, the guy said, I'm telling you why we're so successful is because we don't allow complaining and our, our company has been so successful because we have an atmosphere of positivity and if anything needs changing, people know they can go to somebody and express their opinions and they can get it changed, but we do not tolerate useless negativity. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like those two twins. You know, the two twins, one of them, he was, he was just the complainer. He was the person that everybody recognized as the complainer. The other one, glass half full, you couldn't get him down. There's no way he was going to be negative about anything. And the parents decided, okay, you know, is this is just, just how they are or could we arrange a situation that would get this negative complaining child to be happy and excited about life and get this, this child that never complains, would, could we arrange a situation where he would complain? So they said, well, we're going to do an experiment. So they take this one complaining kid and they put him in a room that's full of everything he loves the most. Cakes, candy, cookies, uh, toys, video games, everything he loves. Put him in there. Going to leave him for four hours. Take the other kid who's always happy and bright and doesn't complain about anything. They put him in a massive room full to waist high of horse manure. And that's it. When he walks in, it falls out of the door. And they shove him on in and say, hey, you just got to stay in there for four hours. He says, okay. They wait the four hours. They go up to the room where the kid is that is always complaining. They open it. They think, okay, he's had everything he wanted for four hours. He's got to be happy. He comes out moaning and groaning. He says, well, I ate too much cake. That first bite was good, but after the third piece, I about ate way too much. My stomach hurts. Couldn't get past level two. That one video game didn't have any of the cheat codes. Said all the toys and stuff. I broke two of them. I got to get out of this place miserable. They thought, what in the world? I mean, if, if he's complaining about all that great stuff he's got in his room, what is our other son? So they go in, open the door, wait for some of that manure, and they see him all the way across the room, manure flying in the air, and he's just laughing, cracking up. They're thinking, what in the world is going on? So they call for him. He says, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. So he makes his way through all the manure, comes back to the door. He's covered in horse manure, covered. Got a big old grin on his face. And they say, man, You've been in a room full of horse manure for four hours. What do you got to be happy about? He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, in a room full of this much horse manure, I figured there had to be a pony in here somewhere, and I'm going to find him. <laughs> well, you know, I think some of us aren't looking for the pony. And some of us are sitting in a room with everything that we could possibly imagine. And we still find stuff to complain about. I think this question is very pertinent, and let's apply it. 
What if everything you thought was wrong and worth complaining about right now, right now, uh, let's say you want to, you're trying to redo a, a bathroom and you want to get that done. It's expensive at this time. What if everything, everything right now that you had to complain about was fixed to your exact liking? Tomorrow, would you have anything to complain about? You know what we do, though, wouldn't we? You just fixed everything to my exact liking. I've got everything exactly how I want it. And tomorrow we'd say, yeah, but it's raining today. Oh, but it's real hot today. Or, yeah, I got my bathroom fixed. I'm excited about that now. What are we going to do about that kitchen? And here's the point. Complaining has nothing. Now, now get this. Nothing to do with your outside circumstances. Now, you think it does. You think, well, I wouldn't complain if this was the case, or I wouldn't complain if... No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with your outside circumstances. Complaining is absolutely, totally, 100%, and completely figured out and done internally. You complain not because of what's going on around you. You complain because of who you are on the inside. Here's the beauty of it. You can change the situation that you're in by deciding today, I will not complain again. Now, here's what's going to happen. If you decide, I will not complain again, do you think that for the rest of this day, you'll be able to go without complaining? No, probably not. Probably not. But if you woke up every single day and said, the Lord has blessed me beyond my belief, beyond anything I could possibly imagine, and today I'm going to try to not complain at all. You think you could do a little better today? And a little better, better tomorrow? And a little better the next day? Do you think you could adjust your character to be like the mind of Christ so that at some point in your life, People are in a situation with you and they are complaining and they look at you and say, well, what do you think about it? Well, I just think it's amazing that God gives us a country where we're free to worship even if the air conditioner's not on. I mean, quit being, you know, Pollyanna. What do you really think about it? Well, I think it's awesome that Jesus Christ came down and lived in a world that wasn't anything like heaven and he never complained one time and I'm just glad to get to be on Jesus' side. Well, what do you really think? Do you think if the Lord's church as a whole decided we're going to have the mind of Christ and we are going to refuse to complain that we would be blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we shine as lights in the world? You put somebody that doesn't complain in the world and the world can't help but see that's not how I act, and I wish I could, and I wonder why they do. And I want what they've got. Well, you know what I love about preaching on complaining and teaching on it? If you go over, people can't complain about it. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Oh, you went 10 minutes over. Are you going to complain about it? I mean, what? Huh? <laughs> hey, I love you guys. Appreciate you having me here this weekend. And let's all determine to be the lights of the world as it relates to being the kind of people that show the mind of Christ.